Uh, today, as we uh, get into God's Word, we're going to focus on rest a little bit. And uh, we're not going to take a nap during the service or anything like that. I hope not. Uh, oh, I just turned off the computer here. I think my computer needs a rest. Huh? But when we think of rest, what comes to your mind? Do you think of uh, yeah, good old-fashioned nap? That's what I think of, I'll be honest. Uh, what about uh, going to a beach? <laughs> uh, we're not closest beach to us is uh, Grace, ba- Grace Lake, is that right? <laughs> Maybe Yellow Banks, kind of a little beach there. But uh, uh, how often do you think of rest as that soul rest that we get in God? Peace with God, which is the greatest rest, uh, as opposed to that uneasiness that we feel uh, because of our sin. Uh, yeah, so today we are looking at entering into his rest. Uh, God's rest is something that we enter into uh, with him as believers. Uh, so that we're going to be in, we're in Hebrews 4 today, uh, verses 7 through 13, 7b through uh, 13. The writer says that today, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God wouldn't have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us, therefore, make every, every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight, everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Let's pray. God, we do thank you for this word that is alive and active and for your Holy Spirit that speaks to us, uh, your written word and your spoken word through the Holy Spirit. We thank you uh, that we get to be here today and to grow in your word and see where we may uh, not be moving forward in your word and moving forward and trusting you. Uh, Help us today to be encouraged by your presence and to be encouraged by your word and uh, to see it not as uh, a suggestion, but as a command uh, and a command that leads to blessing. Uh, We pray today that we can all enter into your rest and uh, have your peace as we trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. I enjoy a good night's rest. Uh, They don't come by too often, but when they come, you really enjoy them. Uh, And uh, whether it's, uh, you know, physical, mental, whatever kind of rest, God designed us to rest. We need rest. Um, And I think for many, many uh, years, we've understood that we need rest. We certainly need it, of course. Uh, but you ever think of like, why is it we need, or why is God, uh, why did God create us in that way? Uh, and really looking to the, to the science of it, really, um, there was a group that did a study, a sleep study, to see what it is that happens when we sleep. When we sleep, uh, they said actually, you know, what happens is that it, when, when our brains kind of nap, when, when we nap, our, the synapses that connect the brain's neurons. Uh, they actually shrink. They shrink by up to up to 20%. Uh, and what this does is whatever inconsequential inc- information that we have, it kind of gets wiped out and, the, and helps us retain the important memories, the important memories, the new, new, and get room for new memories. Uh, maybe that's why you know, certain colleges and universities have created snooze rooms. Uh, 24-hour libraries during finals, and you can actually take a, take a little nap uh, as you're cramming, right? Uh, and 
there used to be a place in Minneapolis called Mini Nap Olis. You could do your shopping and go take a nap. Uh, pay I don't know, seven, eight dollars an hour. Just, just take a, take a little nap. I, I'd pay probably more than that uh, to get a good a good nap when needed. Uh, well, we know we need six to eight hours of sleep per night. Uh, that's what we should get to, to have a healthy night's rest, to have a healthy, to have a healthy body, healthy functioning brain, everything. Uh, we need at least six hours uh, per night. And if not, what happens? Yeah, <laughs> of course. We are grouchy. Uh, it, it ruins our mood, uh, destroys our next day workout if we're working out, right? Uh, increases your risk for heart disease. Maybe you haven't thought about that one, or, or dementia. Uh, it can inhibit your ability to retain memories and learn new skills uh, and even make you gain weight. Now, even to be fair, if you get too much sleep, though, uh, you're 33% more likely to get, to get heart disease. Uh, so there's a balance we've got to keep here, right? But almost, God didn't make us to sleep all day. Uh, he created us to work and to, and to rest. Uh, well, I share this, I share this today because uh, God wired us in this way, to, to, to rest, and more important than the physical rest is the spiritual rest. We need that spiritual rest uh, that only our God can give us. Uh, the, the text I read today, uh, Hebrews, speaks of uh, actually a way of entering into, uh, moving into God's rest. Uh, and in, in this context of this chapter, we're going to pull out, there's three ways, three ways that we see, three types of, of rest, if you will, uh, that we could find uh, from the writer of Hebrews. Uh, I believe it was Paul, but we, don't, we really don't know. Uh, so I'll just say the writer of Hebrews. And they were definitely an academic person that really got into, into depth and used the highest form of Hebrew. Uh, right? But uh, pulls out three, we see three uh, ways that we find rest, God's rest. The first one is, um, is that peace, that peace with God. Uh, don't know Jesus, you don't know peace, Right? But if you know Jesus, you know peace, peace with God. And it's only through following and trusting Jesus. Uh, there was an early Christian theologian and philosopher who was, experience, uh, who was not experiencing this peace. Uh, a restlessness uh, deep inside of him. And he really tried to, he tried to find it in many ways. Uh, excessive pleasures. At the end of the day, he, 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 he didn't get it. He didn't get that rest. Even false religions, uh, he tried out, didn't find that rest. Philosophy, couldn't find it there. Uh, overindulgence, could not find it there. Um, and he actually cries out, how long, O Lord, uh, until my soul is satisfied and finds that peace. Uh, and shortly after, he found it. He found his freedom from sin uh, and the peace that only God can give. He, he read the book of Romans, and shortly after that, committed his life to the Lord, and he got baptized. And 10 years later, after communion with God, 10 years later, after he commits to the Lord, uh, here's what he says. Our hearts are restless till they find their rest in God. He finally found that rest. And who was that? Augustine. St. Augustine, he, he penned that. Our hearts are restless uneasy until they find their rest in God, until they are, are fully engaged and committed to him. Their life is all about him, not the pleasures, not the uh, false religions or philosophy or whatever it may be. Only God can give us the rest our souls need. Uh, until then, or just be restless in another circumstance until we are uh, in Christ and, and found fully in him. Uh, second rest is uh, God's rest after creation. We know it's six days God uh, created, and the seventh day he, he rested, right? Uh, what's really interesting here is those six days, uh, we, we read, you know, at the end of each account, there was morning, and there was evening, first day. There was morning, and there was evening, the third day. Morning and evening, the sixth day. It's kind of a, you see that pattern there. 
Uh, and then on the seventh day, that's not there. It doesn't say there was morning and there was evening. There's no mention. And the rabbis uh, took this as seventh day, implying that God's rest is still going on. And we can enter into that. That, that day hasn't ended. That seventh day is still going. And God's in his rest, and we can join him uh, in that rest, uh, implying that his rest goes on forever, all the way into heaven. Um, our text today, we, we have Joshua. Now, what did Joshua do? He, went with, he took some spies into the promised land, right? Uh, first off, uh, some people didn't believe Joshua and Caleb, and they said, oh, too many giants there, right? But later on, Joshua was able to lead the people uh, the believing people into the promised land. It says he gave them a type of rest in the, into, the, into the promised land. Uh, but it says uh, if Joshua would have given them rest, right, there, was, there wouldn't remain a rest, Sabbath rest for the people of God. We wouldn't be saying it today. In Psalm 95, uh, David said, uh, it's not just for those that were with Joshua, but for all God's believers, uh, followers, uh, Psalm 95 says, if you hear his voice, as we read in Hebrews here, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts like your ancestors did that didn't trust God, but tested them, uh, tested God in the wilderness. Uh, and he ends the psalm saying, God declared on oath uh, that they would never enter his rest. Uh, but since David said today, uh, many years after Joshua went to the promised land, uh, shows us today, today, right now, we can, there's an opportunity that we can not enter his rest, right? We can say no to God and not follow him where he's calling us by faith. Uh, but today, if we hear his voice, we can enter in. Enter into the, to the rest uh, and his uh, seventh day rest, uh, if you will. Uh, maybe it's a first time decision when you first came to Christ. Uh, or maybe it's that next step of obedience and trust, trusting him in something you've never done before. Uh, we have opportunity to enter his rest on a daily, <laughs> daily basis. But also we have opportunity to have restlessness if we do not, if we are at odds with what God, God's calling us to do something. Uh, we say, we keep saying no. And there is a day where if we keep saying no long enough, whether it's first time committing to him, or just following him, our hearts get hardened. And each time we say no, what happens? A little harder. Each time I say no to God, it gets a little harder. The, the easiest time to say yes to God is the very first time. But as I keep saying no, I'll do that later, God. Uh, it gets harder. It gets harder and harder. And our hearts get harder. Uh, and we're not as sensitive to, to God's leading, and the day may come where God's knocking on the door, and you don't even hear it. Uh, so he says, today, don't wait, today, if you hear his voice, go, enter in, trust him, obey him. Uh, don't just follow his instructions or suggestions, no, follow his, where he's calling you to, to an area to obey him in. Um, if you currently have some kind of uneasiness, you know, there's times in our, in our Christian walk where we should have a little bit of uneasiness. That's telling me that God's at work in me. Uh, and I, we all, we're all uh, works in progress, right? Until heaven. <laughs> but if there is some uneasiness uh, in an area in your life and in your faith, I say thank God for that. Because you're still feeling him. You're still sensing his spirit. Even though uh, it's something that needs to get removed from your life, or added maybe, uh, but thank God that you still have sensitivity. Uh, you think of all the lepers in Jesus' day, um, the reason they suffered so much is because leprosy leads to you can't, your, your nerves get destroyed, and so you get a cut on your hand, you don't know it, gets infected, you can lose your whole hand, right? Uh, I think there's a lesson in that, like to thank God for pain, <laughs> uh, and, and times where we feel uh, maybe some uneasiness from him. Uh, so if you are wrestling through something God, you're, you're wrestling God with, I would say, yeah, thank you for the uneasiness. Uh, but don't wait to move, or the day may come where you don't even sense him. You don't sense him speaking. 
So the third area of rest, as we can see here, as you know here, uh, is entering to the promised land. Rest. And this is where we want to uh, camp out for the rest of the message. Uh, this is the main focus here. And it's, this is one that, if something's repeated, it's what? In the Bible? It's repeated. It's important. And we see this over and over again, uh, how often God speaks about the promised land and God's people entering in uh, to the promised land. And we see how many times many didn't enter because of what? Why the many Israelites did not enter in because of their unbelief. They didn't believe. Think about this. Uh, God just wiped out the greatest army for them. Uh, Moses leads them. Uh, we have the ten plagues. Uh, the, the last plague, uh, Pharaoh's just begging God's people to leave. He's even paying them, right? And uh, the, where his firstborn son had died. And then we come in and God wipes them out in the Red Sea, right? Uh, and God took, took, took out that, the, the biggest army <laughs> in the, the known world then in a moment. And they hit... They, later on, they see there's giants <laughs> in the promised land. Those are, they were nothing compared to that army, right? Uh, but how oftentimes do we do that? God rescued us from our greatest enemy, which is what? Sin and eternal death. And he overcame that in us and when we became a Christian. But we have this little, little, little soldier, maybe, that gets in the way uh, we may call it a giant because we're not used to it. And we refuse to move forward in that. Uh, although God did the, the greatest miracle already that's already been done, we, we, we can't trust him enough uh, for, some, for something smaller. Uh, but as they went through the wilderness, they got tested. Uh, tested and even test, they tested the Lord as they refused to, 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 to believe him. And trust me, they weren't meant to, how many years were they in there in the wilderness? Forty years. Was that God's plan? To 40 years to be doing this? Does God want us doing this for 40 years? Eating manna? I think God has something way better than manna. It's called milk and honey, right? Moving forward into the promised land. And that's not a picture of heaven. Heaven, yes, is going to be amazing. But that's the now. My faith right now, having that the joy of the Lord and, the, and, and the God's love just spewing out of me, um, that's the promised land, being full, having that abundant, full life uh, where you're contagious. Uh, so God didn't want to meet manna forever. That was just supposed to be a short period, and God allowed some tests. But the problem was uh, they failed every test. Uh, when it came to no water, they didn't say, oh, God, the, he created all things. He'll provide water for us. If he called us here, he didn't give us water. And he was patient, and he brought water out of a rock, right? Uh, and later on, provided manna for food, and, and occasionally quail, right, was on the menu. Uh, but they started complaining to Moses. I would complain, too. Like, as church folks, if we're not growing in faith, we're going to be complaining about every little thing that happens. Because the main thing is not getting issued, taken take care of. My rest in God. That peace of God because I might be at odds. I'm not trusting him in that area I need to trust him in. Uh, they say a funny thing happened on the way to Canaan. Uh, let me uh, read Deuteronomy 8, 15 through 16. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of a hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known. For why? 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 It says to humble and test you so that in the end you, it might go well with you. Think about that. I would say these tests were ordained by God. So they would be humbled and it would end and go well uh, with, with those Israelites. Now think about this. If, they, if God just picked them up out of Egypt and just dropped them right into the promised land of Canaan, what could happen? Pride. They could think, 
uh, they were meant to be a pampered people rather than a prophetic people to share the glory of God. And they would have thought it was all about all they're doing you know, eventually. They would, they would forget God. So God allowed those. They, he was trying to prepare them for the promised land. Uh, so he brought in tests. That's, when, we, when we face a test in our lives, uh, we got to say, okay, this is an opportunity to turn this test into a testimony. Because uh, you can't have a testimony without a test first, right? And we can't have something, that, a new song to praise God about uh, until we have that new <laughs> test to overcome. And uh, those tests strengthen our faith, but they also prepare us uh, to not forget God and get us ready uh, for the promised land. Uh, and maybe I would even include there to get ready for heaven. Uh, if you want to enter into the promised land, that land overflowing with way more than enough spiritually, no matter what you face in life, and to say, with God, I can do all things, right? Not just read it and say it, but know it, right? Uh, and have that shalom. Of that, when I say promised land, just think of shalom, that everything functioning as God intended it, uh, the shalom of God, everything overflowing with God's promises, promised land, Overflowing with God's promises, right? Uh, if we want that, we got to expect <laughs> expect a little difficult difficulties to come, a little bit of challenges uh, to come. Uh, one to get us ready and humbled to not forget God, but also to see uh, for opportunity to see Him work. Because uh, until we have that challenge or that thing that only God can help us with, right? Uh, we need that. We need the opportunity. Uh, and that final test, that the, when Joshua was about to take the people into the land, they saw those, those giants, uh, they, you know, they went back to the default setting. They didn't uh, believe Joshua and Caleb. Uh, so God said, I'm gonna, I'll, take the, I'll take the next generation. Uh, and trust me, that wasn't without difficulty, was it? The new generation that went in, did they face trials? Uh, yeah, they had to cross the Jordan, right? And God parted the Jordan for them. And also, uh, there's this land called Jericho, well-fortified city. They trusted God, and they overcame it, right? Um, but that first generation, uh, even though God performed many miracles, God can do all kinds of miracles in our lives, and we can still be at unrest and unbelief, even in the presence of God doing miracles, uh, it wasn't them saying, oh, we'll, we'll follow your instructions someday. What God, no, I, he was, here says it was unbelief and disobedience, actually disobedience. Uh, so when God calls me to is, is zero in on something on me to move forward and maybe uh, it's serving in some way or giving in some way, and I say no, it's actually an act of disobedience. Uh, and I'll, I'll be settling for manna, <laughs> uh, manna in the wilderness. Uh, manna was not on the menu, I like to say. There, there was no manna on God's menu. He, he didn't intend that, but when we, can, when we say no to God and continue to, to say no, we're gonna, we have nothing but manna to eat. Uh, over and over, we just gets kind of almost the same thing as the world may uh, provide. No matter what idol the world may follow, it's all going to lead to one thing, eternal death and restlessness. Uh, but as I trust God in faith, it, it, it leads to his promises, the promised land, abundant life, and growing in the knowledge of the Lord and knowing him uh, experientially, right? Maybe you need an opportunity. To, maybe you feel some restlessness. You've been following the Lord for a long time, and you're feeling like, man, I'm just, you know, something's, I'm just not full. I don't feel... <laughs> that I am experienced the promises of God, or that promised land, the abundant life of the shalom of God to the fullest. Uh, maybe you need an opportunity. That's all you need is an opportunity to serve uh, or ministry to, to do something you've never done before. Uh, if I can just continue to the same old, same old, which is not bad you're serving God, you know, if I got used to serving God in a certain way, and I'm not saying just quit. Like, for example, like, you know, God... Uh, give me the gift to play drums, right? And if I just say, oh, you know, I'm not going to quit drums because God put something new in my life, but I can continue doing the old uh, uh, things that God has equipped me to do. 
But maybe we just need, a, you might just need something new because you're so used to something, you know, you've seen God work in that old way. You need to see him work in a new way. And it's not testing God, but trusting him. Uh, Joey is getting us, showing us a little bit about single parent provision. Maybe that's an opportunity eventually where you see uh, you may be able to help out in the nursery. Uh, if we meet here on Wednesday night with the single, with SPP, uh, single parent provision, or maybe uh, financially supporting or uh, maybe helping them with home maintenance, something you've never done ever before. Uh, let me tell you this one thing. If we're going to grow in faith, there's going to be a need for fear. <laughs> there's going to be that fear that comes first. That needs to overcome. That needs to be overcome. And uh, on the other side, if we just pray through, we'll see greater faith uh, goes through. But but whatever you, God may be leading you to personally, or as, maybe as as a whole entire church, um, when we say yes, <laughs> even though it may scare the living daylights out of us, and never and we never trusted God. Uh, with my finances in this way. I never trusted him with my energy in this way. I never, I've never witnessed anybody before. I've never opened up with somebody else about, about my faith. I've never prayed with somebody in public before. Someone needed prayer, just open up and, and just pray with them. That just scares the daylights out of you. Uh, if God's leading you to it, right, he'll lead you through it. <laughs> uh, he'll give you what you need to do it. When God orders something, he doesn't order something without paying for it. He gives us what we need. If God's individually calling you to do something, he, he will give you exactly what you need. Uh, where God guides, God what? Provides. He provides. And in general, through the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit Christ, uh, the, uh, the invisible Christ and the visible believer. Um, but when I, if I do say no, whatever that thing may be, uh, it just pleases the Lord. It displeases him. We want to please the Lord, and it also quenches the spirit. Uh, I think we, we focus a lot on grieving the spirit, but quenching the spirit, it's like the spirit's ready to go, and we just pour a bunch of cold water on, on the fire. Uh, and it leads us settling with for manna. Manna, manna, manna. Every day, manna. Uh, it's interesting, this, this chapter starts talking about the Word of God. Uh, the writer's speaking about these Israelites going through the wilderness, trusting God, going to the promised land, and then poof, like almost like a cut and paste in the wrong place. Maybe you've done that before. Uh, and send an email to the wrong person or cut and paste something. Uh, your text message, I've done that one. You know, texting someone's number to them, but text it to the very person I just copied the number from. <laughs> Well, maybe it, it seems like it was just a, just a copy and paste. It almost seems like out of place. Well, all of a sudden, the writer starts speaking about the word of God. It's talking, it was talking about the Israelites trusting God and going uh, and believing God for the promised land and overcoming those giants. Uh, but he's, all of a sudden, poof, for the word of God. There was no mention of the word of God yet. But then, poof, the word of God. I mean, when I first started reading the Bible, I was like, it's, it's kind of strange. You know, I, don't, I don't understand, but now uh, it makes sense to me uh, because the Word of God, right, is more, you know, we have the written Word of God, right, and then we have the spoken Word of God. I mean, you know, for example, the Bible might not say, oh, go, go help Julie with single parent provision. You might not see that, you know, in the Word of God, but the Holy Spirit says, serve, Generally, but then it says, and, and, and maybe Julie, you're talking to Julie, and uh, she's like, this is really exciting to see what God's doing here. And uh, so the specifics, the, the spoken word, the Holy Spirit saying, go specifically to this place. Uh, kind of like Philip and the Ethiopian. I need you to go right to this place and talk to this person uh, right, right now, right? Uh, so the spoken word is like, the, that's what they were disobeying. God was speaking uh, Joshua and Caleb said, this is the way to go, right? But they didn't trust him, and they rejected the word, the living, active word of God. And uh, they weren't able to enter into the rest. And today, as he speaks to us, uh, when we say yes, we find out. We find the rest. We enter into that rest that only he can give and the world can't take away, uh, many, like many of, of his blessings. I want to end uh, with two quotes 
to encourage us um, as we hear the word of God, not just to read the written word, but as the Spirit may be leading us to something specific. Uh, Spurgeon said this one, the same sun which melts wax hardens clay. And the same gospel which melts some persons to repentance hardens others in their sins. So think about that. The same, same God speaking uh, can, can just soften my heart as I obey him, right? But that same word, uh, if I say no, will harden my heart uh, and make, it, make me even more resistant. Uh, then Vance Havner says something very similar. Let it never be forgotten that although we, be, we may be doing nothing about the word we hear, the word will be do something to us. The same sun melts ice and hardens clay, and the word of God humbles or hardens the human heart. So whatever, when God says, and God's a God who speaks, isn't he not? I mean, it was Jesus is the word made flesh, right? <laughs> He's a God who speaks to us, uh, to his people. Uh, when he speaks, say yes. <laughs> do not let, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Uh, but enter into his rest, the peace that only God can give and the world, like I said, cannot take away. Uh, let's pray together. God, we do thank you for your, your living and your active word. Uh, we thank you that you're a God who, who, does, who speaks to us. And uh, we ask you, God, to point out, uh, as, as uh, uncomfortable as it may be, show us where we are just going through the motions. Show us where we are not moving in faith and trusting you. And uh, show us where, our, where we are dealing with some unbelief. Uh, we believe Lord, but help us with our unbelief, uh, where we're not taking full advantage of the promises of God and entering into that fullness that, uh, that only you can give. And uh, so we can be a witness, not just for us to enjoy the fruit uh, and the, to enjoy the milk and honey, but so we can share it. So others can see that only God uh, can give me peace through this circumstance. Only God uh, can give me rest in every way. Uh, we thank you for this day and thank you for your voice that you speak uh, to us so lovingly, so patient, uh, and with such compassion. Uh, help us enthusiastically to obey you uh, at every turn, we pray in Jesus' name.